Excelsior, you swinging hip cats and cool, groovy dudes. Welcome to our Disco Tech, where we will be reviewing each issue of Vietnam A Go Go, Marvel's Military Mag, with all of the swinging hippie action that you can throw your socks at. I'm Josh, and joining me is... Make way for Donovan. And letting the hair down again tonight, it's John. <laughs> So we, um, last year we recorded, um, uh, we did our first episode and as it is with podcasting scheduling, um, it took us a year to do another one, but Hey, you know, uh, we've had longer hiatuses than this. I think it was like six years or something between like issues, uh, 47 and 48 of classics. So, so sorry about saying weekly in the promo. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Well, weekly, because like this is coming out, um, during a period of month that entails a week. I... <laughs> <laughs> it is coming out during a Way week. to swing yeah. it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's, it, it's, it's Flash Thompson logic right there. Um, this would be when I would read emails, but every single email is the same, which is everyone calling us a liar, saying that this book doesn't exist. I don't know what you're all talking about. Come on. Yeah. I mean, do you think we'd really go through all this trouble just to, like, lie? Issue one of Vietnam A Go-Go is the only comic I ever got slabbed by uh, the CGC. So it's real, y'all. <laughs> yeah. I, I was a little ticked off when um, – re- rest in peace, Stan Lee, you know, the creator of Vietnam A Go-Go. But I was a little ticked off when, like, <laughs> it was not, like, mentioned, like, like during any of this. I'm, I'm trying not to laugh. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Get him out now because the laughs are coming. Um, but yes, if if you're just tuning in now to our to our second episode, editor's note, see episode one. Vietnam Go Go was um, Marvel's military comedy mag that ran, you know, starring Flash Thompson and Buzz Baxter and uh, General Ross, you know, aka as they affectionately call him, Uncle Thundy. Um, you know, having adventures during the Vietnam War. You know, it, we're it's basically like an early spinoff mag because it's Buzz Baxter from Patsy Walker fame, General Ross from The Incredible Hulk. And Flash Thompson from Amazing Spider-Man. Um, as we established last episode, the um, a comic was created because Lyndon Johnson personally asked Stan Lee, I need you to make the Vietnam War look cool and fun. Because if they were having problems with like youths burning their draft cards and stuff like that. So Stan Lee took that directive and ran with it. And if you want to know more, see our swinging first episode done last year, around April 1st, funnily enough. <laughs> How about that? So, any thoughts before we dive back into, you know, um, the mystic jungles of Vietnam? Just when you thought that this book couldn't get any more uh, sweat-inducingly offensive, it couldn't get any more unpredictable, it couldn't get any more ridiculous, we kept on reading the series. <laughs> I don't know I don't know what I was expecting, but, um, you know, you had, you had threatened that there are more Marvel uh, characters that appear in this. And again, it's like... I didn't know that Vietnam was like, you know, Marvel code for Las Vegas and everyone just goes on there to party, but it's it's not exactly convenient to get to. <laughs> I mean, you either have to cross the Pacific Ocean or Asia, depending on which direction you're coming from. It's not it's not easy. Which is weird because in one of in, in one of the issues that we're covering tonight, they mention like transatlantic flights and it's like, but that's not what transatlantic is, but <sighs> It wouldn't be the first time that Stan made that mistake. See the early Hulk issues. Yeah, well, and and speaking of Hulk too, like, like, yeah, we stab, uh, we said we read in one of Stanley's like letters last issue that apparently uh, Thunderbolt Ross commutes because he has an experimental rocket from Reed Richards that takes in the Vietnam and back, so he could have adventures <laughs> in both the Hulk magazine and Vietnam. But it, implying that, that he's not stationed to actually sense. go down there as, as a military operative. <laughs> But, like, they're not giving that rocket to the soldiers to, I don't know, like, go home and see their families. <laughs> don't be silly. <laughs> Getting started, um, issue four, you know, we open up with um, the cover where we have a rocket in the middle of a launch pad um, in the jungle. And it has an open hatch. And Buzz and Flash are curiously, like, walking towards, like, the hatch of this rocket, you know, inquisitively. And Flash says, well, we Buzzy, old boy, this groovy rocket is sure out of this world. And you see, like, in the background, you know, with, like, uh, the jungle and everything, um, Uncle Thundy Ross is in the bushes, hiding in the background, and he's holding a remote control, and he's looking really sinister, 
And the thought balloon says, and once I press this launcher, Thompson and Baxter will be out of my world. And a little blurb in the bottom corner of the cover that says, all this, and would you believe, fun and freaky, Foggy Nelson? (laughs) Let's get freaky. (laughs) So any thoughts on this cover before we open up this travesty of, of, of a book? I mean, it's it's fun and like Foggy Nelson. You you, you got to wonder why is this New York lawyer in Vietnam? But <laughs> and why really is he a to... selling point? <laughs> <laughs> why is Foggy Nelson a selling point? <laughs> like <laughs> they like advertise that on the cover. Like <laughs> you think Karen Some... Page would be a lot more of a delectable like you know advertisement? No, it's Foggy Nelson, everyone's most fatuous lawyer. <laughs> And if this was a TV show, I'd be like, okay, I guess, like, the other actors are, like, too expensive. But no, this is a comic. He could have drawn anyone he wanted in there. But, like, fucking it. Like, there's some kid who has, like, his last, like, uh, 12 – I think there were still 12 cents at this point. Like, 12 cents. And he's like, oh, man, what do I get? Vietnam a go-go or, like, Avengers? And he's, like, looking back and forth. And he's like, oh, wait, Foggy Nelson's in this one? Oh, Vietnam a go-go it is. So. Well, also, like, like going from, like – this is – what year is this again? 67. But, like, going from, like, Gene Colan Daredevil, where Foggy is re- rendered, you know, rather realistically, you know, he's, he has a bit of, like, chub on him. But, you know, he's a, he's a he's an adult man. To Dan DiCarlo <laughs> drawing Foggy Nelson, it is a dramatic sea change. Very grotesquely, I might add. But <sighs> So, we open this book with Patsy Walker sitting at her desk, staring at a piece of paper. She has a dumbfounded look on her face, as if she's overwhelmed and not sure, like, if she's believing what's on this paper. Behind Patsy is her rival, roommate, frenemy, Hetty Wolf, with her arms crossed, like, you know, like as, as if they're in high school and being mean to each other, saying, Why the long face, Patsy Puss? You've been staring at that paper for hours. Really, for hours? What is that? The latest <laughs> space adventure from Jack Kirby? Uh, if she stiff paper wouldn't be the comic but okay even more outrageous hetty it's the latest letter from buzz patsy answers your ne'er-do-well high school sweetheart turned fiance soldier buzz baxter and that's how you know that this is written by stanley <laughs> <laughs> the one and only patsy i mean the one and only patsy says It's just a letter. What's so unbelievable about that, Hetty asks. That's the thing, Hetty. I've read this letter, but it's so outrageous and groovy, I don't know whether to believe it, said Patsy. Oh, come on, Patsy Puss. How exciting can the Vietnam War possibly be, Hetty asks. (laughs) Well, face front and get a load of this, Patsy says as she begins reading the letter out loud. Uh, And I have to scroll down on Microsoft Word. Dear Patsy, thanks for sending the pies. The guys really love them. The only one in our bunk who has any cooking skills is old guy mailman, so it was nice to get a little treat from home. You wouldn't believe what my pal Flash and I have been up to, so sit back, turn up your stereo – you don't do that when you read a letter – and get ready to blast off as I tell you about how Flash and I became – and it says in big letters because this is like the title splash – the first cadets in space. <laughs> <laughs> and you get um the credits written by space case stan lee writing from the rings of saturn art by dark matter don de carlo drawing from the dark side of the moon lettering by astronaut Artie semek lettered in a basement at the bottom of this title thing there's a little editor's note that says stay patient true believers foggy will show up later in the book so be on the lookout <laughs> Because thank God, you know, someone might like get up to page four and be like, where is Foggy? I want my money back. <laughs> I want my 12 so, cents back. <laughs> so uh, Buzz's narration says it all started one day when old Uncle Thundy did a surprise inspection of our bunk. He was in one of his pleasant moods. And uh, th- there's a little bit of a contrast between what Buzz is saying and like, you know, on the reliable narrator and like what's actually happening because – Ross is like kicked down the door of their bunk and he's like screaming, all right, you bumbling barracks brains, it's inspection time. So Flash Buzz, Guy Mailman, Gary Grenade, and Brainy Bobby all stand up to salute and they say in unison, yes, sir, Uncle Thundy, sir. But Gary stands up so fast that the grenade he was polishing, ex- you know, uh, is dropped and it explodes on Ross's foot. But <laughs> <laughs> Killing him. <laughs> <laughs> you would Ross think. didn't need that leg anyway. But like, this is like an alternate 
universe where I guess grenades, like when they explode, it's like Looney Tunes and like nothing happens. His beak like, is blown back to his head. <laughs> like Ross barely reacts to this. Like so, he screams, "Like it's General Ross! I told you not to call me that!" And darn it, Gary, you ruined my new boots. Those were a special gift from Dean Rusk, who I, I had to Google. Apparently, he was uh, Secretary of State uh, <laughs> in the Lyndon Johnson administration. How dignified. <laughs> <laughs> so gary says sir sorry uncle fundy sir which like only makes rocks ross turn more red because like he said don't call him uncle fundy and buzz says cheer up old uncle fundy and flash joins in yeah as they point to his uh rune boots which like they're mostly intact but now there's like holes in the front like hobo boots with ross's toes sticking out and so like flash says now your boring establishment boots are a bear or a pair of groovy swinger sandals and buzz says out of sight Ross looks like he's like about to erupt at this point, and he says, "If you two like the sandals so much, then they're yours." And he shoves like both of the boots into Thompson and Baxter's mouth. So Buzz's <laughs> narration continues, and he says, "Uncle Thundy was showing off his new shoes and goofing around. It was a real swinging time, but during inspection, he made a discovery that changed his mood from golly green from jolly green giant to green eyed monster. Which green eyed monster is jealousy, not anger. So." You know, I would think that grown man Stanley would know that. So Ross, he's holding up a pair of high heels and lipstick and says, well, 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 who can explain this? And all of the men, his eyes go wide and we get a close up on Guy Mailman as her thought balloon says, oh, no, I'm usually so careful, but I left my women's clothes out. Jonah Ross and the other cadets don't know that I, here we go with exposition, everyone. They don't know that I, Guy Mailman, am really a woman disguised as a man to join the army. But and if she, if feel, she feel, why did she take her Feel free her to forget that because she'll remind you all the time. Yeah, why was she wearing them? <laughs> why did she bring them? Now that Ross has uncovered my secrets, I'll never live it down. I should have hidden my stuff better, but my silly female brain was too distracted by trying to figure out the recipe for Patsy's pies. A girl can't help but be competitive about cooking. So Ross, you know, breaks up this little um, inner monologue by saying, "To think you could hide this from me." But with the proof right in front of me, I know. I know your secret, and I can't believe I was too blind to see it earlier. And Guy has a look on her face like she's nervously accepting her fate. And she says in her th- speech balloon, OK, I admit it. I'm really a gut. But before she can finish, Ross, he's not done talking. He says, one of you has been sneaking a girl in here after hours, <laughs> and I intend on finding out who. Is there something you know, Guy? You look like you have something to say. So we get a panel where you see like everyone's face and um, each cadet is being quiet, but they all have a thought balloon saying what they're thinking about. So guys thought balloon is so he doesn't know, but he suspects I'm sunk. How will I get how will I get out of this one? I guess girls really weren't meant for war after all. And it's like this has nothing to do with being meant for war. And Brainy Bobby says, Foplin is my deduction's reason that the only ones foolhardy enough to sneak a girl in here would be Thompson or Baxter. I hope they confess so the rest of us get off easy. And Gary says, I'd give my best grenade to get out of this mess. And Flash's thought balloon is, I've been sneaking. <laughs> Sorry. Flash's thought balloon is, I've been sneaking my best girl Shashan here to groove to some records, but she doesn't own any anything like this. But Guy does look nervous. And Buzz's thought balloon is, poor guy. He looks like he's about to crack any second. Outside the tent at that moment, we see Shishan wearing a green flower in her hair, which is important because that green flower becomes a plot point later. That's why it's there. She's making her way to the entrance of the bunk, but she stops when she sees Ross through the window. And um, her, uh, thought, uh, her speech balloon says, Flash was supposed to meet me by the lagoon to show me the latest American fashion magazines, and he's three hours late. Why would you wait for three hours? He's probably goofing off with Buzz again. Yikes, it's Ross. I better hide under this bush. He'll want me to reveal the location of my hidden jungle temple. So Buzz's letter narration continues where he says, Flash, you and I gave each other a look, and I could tell we were both thinking the same thing. Guy had been like a brother to us, and brotherhood means you stick out for your fellow man. Guy's record was clean. But Flash and I had been in trouble so many times. What was one more deterrent when we already had a hundred? Besides, we knew we were Uncle Fundy's favorites. He'd go easy on us. So in the next panel, Flash and Buzz say, and like their speech balloon is together because they're saying this in unison. It was us, sir. We had the girl in here. Like, together? <laughs> like, <laughs> <laughs> ran a train on her. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> and I guess all the other cadets are confused because like they say in like big letters, huh? Which is like didn't like Brandy Bobby suspect them like they all, two they panels all, they ago. They all share the same uh, like like word balloon. <laughs> Yeah. And Shashan is overhearing this from the outside and her thought balloon says in big letters, that cad. And Ross says, I knew it. That's it, boys. And we have Shashan running away in tears, Betty Brand style saying, I'll never trust Flash again. How could he? (laughs) Which is the second time that like this has happened in this run where she like overhears Flash not cheating on her and like runs away angry. So back in the tent, Ross grabs Thompson and Baxter by the ears and drags them out. It's cleaning duty for you two soldiers of stupidity. That'll teach you to think <laughs> twice before making my army camp into lover's lane. And he's dragging them off by the ears. And at, But as they're being dragged off, Flash says, gosh, Uncle Thundy, if you wanted us to lend you our ears, all you had to do was ask. And Buzz says, say, <laughs> flash isn't it sweet of Uncle Thundy to drag us out so we don't have to hurt our tootsie toes doing that boring establishment march? And Flash says, you're all hard, Uncle Thundy. <laughs> so... Guy Mailman is looking very forlorn, like, as this is happening, and her thought balloon says, Those poor boys, they took the fall for me, and now they're being punished. I'll never forgive myself. I suppose the gentleman must always come to the rescue of his damsel in distress. Even if even if they don't know she's really a damsel, some things never change. And she's like, oh, they're in so much trouble. that They look like they're having a ball. Like... <laughs> so ross and the boys are now um they've left the bunk and they're now at the launch pad where you see a small rocket that has a red white and blue flag on it and the words usa are under it and ross says all right you dothering dummies this experimental rocket will help us in our fight against the viet commies he never explains how but it will help you space age technology on these poor villagers (laughs) (laughs) son of a bitch (laughs) The Department of Defense is sending some big city lawyer (laughs) to make sure that all the T's are crossed and the I's are dotted. And the editor's note says, and you can probably guess who that daring big city lawyer might be. And they say like daring and like stands when he stands as daring, it's in big letters. So it's like, is he like trying to trick us that it's Matt? But like he already told us it was foggy. (laughs) Right. The thing with these is like the cover kind of gives it away, right? Yeah, so he's like, who can this daring lawyer be? Justice is blind. Face front. <laughs> he works at Nelson and Murdoch. <laughs> he's one of two. <laughs> he's in love with Karen Page. <laughs> that doesn't narrow it down. <laughs> he's also a sleazy mother. <laughs> So Buzz says, say no more, Uncle Thundy. You want to give the rocket a test flight. And Flash says, I can see it now. Flash Thompson, man of the stars. And he has like a little thought balloon dream sequence where he's surrounded by like space age Bond girls. Like they kind of look like Star Trek aliens, but they're in like Bond girl outfits with those, um, you know, like 1950s, like space mysterial helmets on them. And they're like grabbing Flash's foot. Like it's kind of like it's um the poster for Star Wars, even though like that that wasn't published for another 10 years. So Buzz says, don't you mean man of the stars? And Flash says, golly, Buzz, you're the only person that can make a second man seem like a third wheel. And Buzz says, I'm the one who has test pilot experience. And Flash says, I love how they automatically think like, oh, yes, testing this thing. This means that one of us will get girls somehow. (laughs) Yeah, from Mars. (laughs) Yeah. As they fight the Viet Cong, so Flash says, yeah, and the crash is to prove it. So how about it, Uncle Thundy? When do we fly this thing? I, I do want to know. When Flash like says, and the crash is to prove it, that was like a plot point in Patsy Walker. Like Flash's like, plane went down in Vietnam a few years ago in the book. And he Flash likes to veer. Oh, I'm sorry, Buzz's. Yeah, Buzz's like, plane went down in the Patsy Walker book while he was stationed in Vietnam. And he had like severe PTSD. Like that was an arc. But like. Flash is being very glib about it here, but it fits the tone of the book. Yeah, that's you know? because it's Vietnam a go-go. <laughs> yeah. So Ross says, enough. I don't want you to fly it. And Flash and Buzz say, you don't? With their eyes wide in unison. And Ross hands the boys each a toothbrush and says, I want you to scrub it. And they both say in unison, Hoo! And Ross says, this rocket needs to look really good for that big city lawyer tomorrow. Boy, it would take a real daredevil to go to a war zone like this. Okay, once again, we know it's foggy. It's in red lettering. And and also, he's like, it would take a daredevil to come here. You took your daughter here, like, three issues ago. (laughs) So he says, think you boys can clean this without screwing up? 
And they say, sure thing, Uncle Thundy, but can we teeth the toothbrushes when we're done? And Ross says, why would you two want to do that? And Flash says, we forgot to pack ours when we shipped out. <laughs> and Ross says, what? Then what have you two been using to brush your teeth this whole time? And Buzz says, your toothbrush, of course. It's a long... <laughs> <laughs> I love the look on his face when they say that. That's a good joke. <laughs> it's yeah, he's like <laughs> it's like combination anger, shock, disgust. Like Dan DiCarlo, he's not Alex Ross, but he was able to pack so many emotions into well, that. Well, like they're smiling and their eyes are closed, so it kind of reminds me of like a Steve Ditko look. <laughs> <laughs> So Buzz says, you're a toothbrush, of course, and it's a long hike to your bathroom each morning. Thanks for the new brushes, Uncle Thundy. And Flash continues, you're all hearts. And Ross, as like you see, yeah, he looks like he's like about to explode. Mm-hmm. And uh, <laughs> and he says, just get started. As his thought balloon says, at least the Hulk never used my toothbrush. <laughs> so Flash and Buzz go inside the rocket, which seems a bit bigger on the inside than it does on the outside. Um, bigger on the inside? <laughs> It's the TARDIS. (laughs) (laughs) Issue 19, Doctor Who. Not really, though. (laughs) I'm impressed you got that reference. Nice. (laughs) It has panels and buttons everywhere and two seats. And Buzz in his letter to Patsy narration says, You wouldn't believe it, Patsy Pie. A real-life rocket. American ingenuity at its finest. Flash and I were impressed, but we played it cool. And Flash is like, running around, touching all the buttons, say, wowee, it's like something out of Lost in Space. And Buzz says, eat your heart out, Will Robinson. And Flash says, I can just imagine Lieutenant O'Hora doing a go-go dance right there. To which, has Flash and Stanley ever watched Star Trek? Like, <laughs> it was in the movies, right? Like the fan <laughs> dance. Well, like, or, or did Flash or did Stanley think that Uhura was on Lost in Space? <laughs> like, <laughs> the first black female space character lost in space it's like, it's like they saw like a picture of her in a magazine and they see the miniskirt like oh this must be about go-go dancers in space or something like <laughs> so buzz says hey that gives me an idea let's see if any of these buttons is the radio and flash says you can't clean a rocket without some rock and roll and buzz says or should we say rocket roll no, you shouldn't. Never say that. <laughs> so outside, Guy is walking towards the lunch, the launch pad, um, and she's followed by Gary, Grenade, and Brainy Bobby. And they're like, you can tell, that, like they're like trying to like stop her, but she's walking determined. Brainy Bobby says, "But Guy, there's no logical reason for you to incur the anger of General Ross. He's already directed his punishment towards Cadets Thompson and Baxter." And Guy says, "Oh, Brainy Bobby, you're always thinking like a computer." Sometimes you have to think with your heart. Those boys fell on Ross's sword for me, and I absolutely feel horrible. And the thought continues with her thought balloon where she says, I know I'll be getting in trouble, but since I'm secretly a female, we know I can't help but think with my heart and emotions. (laughs) And Gary says, but how did you sneak a girl into camp anyway, guy? That's one thing that I'm wondering. And he's saying wondering, and it's like spread out because he trips over a log. And he drops one of his grenades, which explodes. And Ross is about 10 feet away, and they can see him, but he can't see them. And he says, what was that? And it's like, a grenade exploding is a lot louder than somebody, like, stepping on a twig. So he's like, what was that? Not <laughs> what was like, that noise? <laughs> yeah, like, yeah, like, he's not like, what the? <laughs> like, I don't know. Like, if you were in the forest and a grenade exploded, like, 10 feet from you. You wouldn't say what was that. Oh, um, Jesus Christ, are you okay? <laughs> so Gary says, it's Uncle Thundy. Hide before he sees us. To which I ask, why are you hiding? You were looking for him a second ago. And I'm like, oh, yeah, they have to hide because the plots. You know, the plot can't move unless, like, they're hiding. So the three soldiers duck under some nearby bushes as Ross begins his monologue. Never mind that noise. Well, Thompson and Baxter wanted a ride in this rocket. And they're going to get one. And Ross pulls out a remote control with the words launcher on it. And we have a silent panel of uh, Guy uh, guy Mailman, Bobby Brainy, and like Gary Grenade gasping. And Ross says, too long. Those boys have turned all my gray hairs double gray. And we get like a little um, thought balloon montage of like different things that Flash and Buzz have done to annoy Ross. So one is Ross is taking like a bubble bath and the bathroom wall has a big hole in it because apparently Thompson and Baxter just drove through that bathroom wall with Ross's car. And Ross screams, my car. Wait for and somebody then, to be in the bathroom using it. 
<laughs> so you thought he was they were using yeah that. <laughs> i was waiting for that i was always waiting for <laughs> the comics code wouldn't let that happen probably but like yeah. um um and then the next one is like um <laughs> thompson and baxter are jumping on ross's like giant king-sized like general's bed and ross is saying my bed and then the other one is um buzz and flash are like walking ross's dog but like they've given it a makeover it has a tie-dye collar and hippie sunglasses and like its fur is like you know done in like a hippie ponytail and flash and buzz are beaming like they're proud of this and ross <laughs> says my dog and then <laughs> yeah, that's why he just pulled out his gun and shoot them <laughs> demanding well, them to is, stop <laughs> he is he is launching them into outer space <laughs> so there is that and then the other one is um they're br- um they're in Ross's bathroom again, and Flash is brushing his teeth with Buzz standing behind him waiting his turn. And Ross is saying, my toothbrush, to which, like, didn't Ross not know that they were doing this before? Like, but according to this flashback, he's caught them. Like, <laughs> I guess he was so angry, he got it out of his system. And then the last, like, little fantasy is you see Flash and Buzz. Did you guys ever read, like, Beadley Bailey? I did, yeah. I, yeah. I, I'm more of it, but I never read it. So, like, the, like, Miss Buxley type character, like, Flash and Buzz are flirting with some, like, Miss Buxley-esque, like, character, and Ross is saying, my date! <laughs> so, like, <laughs> if Kurt Busiek... My life! Was... <laughs> my symbiote? <laughs> if, uh... <laughs> If Kurt Busiek and uh, Pat Olaf ever do Untold Tales of Vietnam a go-go, we have, um, you know, prime uh, material right here. Untold so back Tales in the- of Vietnam a go-go. That needs to happen. <laughs> <laughs> I'd, buy, I'd buy that for 99 cents. I'd buy that for $99. <laughs> back in the present, Ross says, those boys never fit in on this planet, so maybe they'll find better luck in the stars. I've packed enough food in there for a three-week, for a three-week trip. They'll hit and inhabit an alien planet by then, and when they do, they'll be someone else's problem. To which I want to stop and say, like, in three weeks, they won't even make it to, like, Mars. Like, no, you're you're murdering them. I, yeah, I, this, I, this is 1967. They have <laughs> no concept of space flight and all that stuff, right? It's like, yeah, yeah. Like, <laughs> you are like, dooming them to a life of starvation. A short life. <laughs> <laughs> a very yeah you're murdering them maybe he knows this and he's just telling himself like this to make himself feel better it's like be oh fine. there's food well, R- well ross later on is like evil right so this is like the beginning of that i like, guess, like, in, in, like, like in like the marvel comics yeah well he, and he's like i don't even know if he's still red hulk um, oh, yeah, i know he's dead right now I, I, i'm reading the hulk is he <laughs> yeah flash, flash is dead too in asm so it's like <laughs> buzz is the last survivor of vietnam a go-go hey man you're <laughs> Uh, I mean, I think that like Stan put the whole like food thing in there. It's so, like, oh, like Ross isn't he? Because like he can't be like a murderer, you know. But <laughs> except for when he's trying to murder the Hulk, which like John, uh, you would have covered this on Make Ours Marvel like last year. Like, didn't Ross try this on the Hulk once? Like, yeah, I was actually kind of going to bring that up in a second. Is like I'm kind of surprised that with all the continuity nods this book has, that there's not like a little note saying. You know, that I did this to the Hulk once. It's like, yeah, he did try to send the Hulk off into space once. It didn't go well. I think Stan forgot, and he doesn't realize he's reusing the same plot. (laughs) So so Ross presses his launcher button, and in Buzz's letter, um, narration to Patsy, he says, I was fiddling with the knobs, trying to find the latest jam from the mamas and papas when... And the rocket starts shaking, and Buzz says, Yikes, Flash! I wanted to move with the music, but this isn't quite what I had in mind. Uh. And Flash <laughs> says, "And Flash says, who's the experienced f- pilot now, Amelia Earhart? Can't tell the radio button from a launch button. And Buzz says, oh, shut up. So the boys look out the panel window, and at this point, it's like, they're like, they, they realize they're off the ground. And they say in unison and surprise for like the like fifth time this issue. We're heading towards the stars. And then you get another panel of like where we're, uh, with Brainy Bobby, Guy Mailman and Gary Grenade all saying in horror, they're heading towards the stars. And Uncle Thundy in his panel said like he's saying the same thing. But with delight, he says 
they're heading towards the stars. <laughs> Calm yourself, Iago. <laughs> and, and so that's end of part one, because this is like the old day where like the issues are like broken up into multiple parts. So the beginning of part two opens up with a splash page of Buzz and Flash in the like they're still in the little rocket and they're like floating, you know, in zero gravity. And in Buzz's letter, he says, so there we were, Patsy Fly, Pie, my pal Flash and I in a rocket heading to outer space. Eat your heart out, Lakia. And I had to look up what Lakia was, and then I got I really, really sad. It's like, yes. why did you? Why, why Stan? Why? <laughs> that's at the beginning. I like, like this means nothing. But like uh, one of my favorite books. That's at the, that's that's at the beginning. The whole Lakia story of, and the terms of the prologue. Sputnik Sweetheart by Haruki Murakami. Which is funny because I guess like technically General Ross is doing a Lakia to them, even though that's not what Stan. That's what I, I, was, I was trying to remember the name of the dog. I was like, he's doing the exact same thing the Russians did. <laughs> <laughs> it, it doesn't happen but like it would have been funny if like they found lakia and rescued him but like lakia got hit by like cosmic rays and was now a super dog <laughs> and that's how he sur- like, like, the, uh, that's how he survived the um in, uh inhumans dog <laughs> lockjaw yeah yeah wow <laughs> that's what happened to lakia he's lockjaw it's canon yes in real life canon <laughs> <laughs> Well, now you've done it, Buzz for Brains. Uncle Thundy's going to wring our necks when he finds out we took this rocket for a joyride without our without his permission. To which I am confused by him saying this whole, like, is Uncle Thundy going to wring our necks? Because, like, are they oblivious to Ross being mad at them? Like, or are they, well, like, they usually are. To... Right. But here he's, like, he's, like, afraid of Ross. So it's, like, I guess whatever works for the gag. So Buzz says, where's your sense of adventure, Flash? We're the first cadets in the stars. And Flash says, that's true. And besides, what Uncle Thundy doesn't know won't hurt him. Yeah. And Buzz says, "And Buzz says, just a trip quick to Pluto and back. And, Uncle Thund- and, and, and we'll be back before Uncle Thundy ever notices we're gone. And Flash says, imagine, we could do the Watusi on Saturn's rings. And Buzz says, or the mashed potato on Mercury. You know, you don't just go to space to dance. And Flash says, "Buzzy old boy, outer space won't know what hit them." And <laughs> yeah, outer space, plural. <laughs> and Buzz says, "There's just one problem." And Flash says, "The Beatles or the Stones?" And Buzz says, "How do we drive this thing?" In big letters. And like when when he says that, like it's an outside shot of the rocket as it's like hurtling through the stars. Meanwhile. Back in Ross's office, he's laying in his chair day- daydreaming, and he says, now that Thompson and Baxter are gone, it's going to be smooth sailing from here. I can see it now. And Ross is, like, dreaming of a muscular ver- – like, he's dreaming of a muscular version of himself that has a full head of brown hair, <laughs> not gray hair. And he's getting a medal um, from, like, I've the I've seen that episode of The Simpsons before. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, like, the Daily Bugle headline says – Viet Kami surrender, quote unquote. Ross is too powerful, says Kami leader. And the Hulk is shaking as he kneels before Ross and says, After the way you win this war, Hulk too scared to be hunted by you. Hulk surrenders. And Betty Ross is like, uh, his daughter is like, with some Ken doll of a soldier and says, Oh, daddy, your bravery and leadership has shown me that I want a man like you, not some scientist like Dr. Banner. Uh... For- <laughs> forget the whole i want a man like you like, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. you say forget i say wait a minute <laughs> <laughs> and then lyndon johnson says i officially <laughs> resigned <laughs> i'm sorry Go ahead. <laughs> and lyndon johnson says i officially resigned the presidency and declare a thunderbolt ross president which <laughs> there is something called the 25th amendment but uh, actually i don't know when the 25th amendment was like uh because i know that like um <sighs> I think during the whole Gerald Ford time, they like made the vacancy act. I don't know. But anyway, Ross has snapped out of his trance when um, the one of the secretaries from uh, issue two, uh, that story that you covered, John, calls him on the intercom and says, that lawyer from New York is here to see you. And Ross says, how many times have I told you not to interrupt my daydreams? Ah, never mind. Send the guy in. He must be blind as a bat if it took him this long to get here. Which I thought, number one, I thought he was coming for tomorrow. And number two, we're still doing this, hints that it's Matt, even though, you, okay, whatever. So, <laughs> Makes you think that maybe they did this story before they even did the cover. That's the only explanation other than the fact that, like, Stan, like, <laughs> I've always had a theory in mind that, like, this was, like, the last book that Stan would do each month. Like, he would do, like, Journey into Mystery, Amazing, you know, Spider-Man, At the 11th Avengers, hour like, you know, and, and then, like, he's, like, this was, like, the last book of the month, so he really just, like, phoned it in. So, 
the door's opened and like the lawyer's standing there, but like he's in the shadow, all silhouetted, and the silhouette makes him look like Daredevil a second because well, like, there are little horns there. <laughs> yes, there's like horns in the shadow. But then in the next panel, he walks closer and the horns were just like Foggy's hair being messed up. So like, surprise, guys, it's Foggy Nelson. <laughs> you all show worst, worst, worst kept secret. <laughs> <laughs> so Foggy says, Foggy Nelson of Nelson and Murdoch, sir, are you General Ross? And Ross says, well, I ain't David Niven. And Foggy's <laughs> a little confused. And he says, I'm sorry, sir. Is David Niven performing tonight for the troops? So Ross sighs and says, never mind. Yes. I'm Ross. I can't believe they finally found a lawyer willing to come here. The last three guys didn't want to make the long transatlantic flights. And Foggy said, well, sir, I needed a change of scenery. And I heard that Vietnam is beautiful in the summer. For freaking who? <laughs> I mean, not, that, not, that, not that it's like, you know, winter wonderland, but like they're, t- they're treating like, a, like it's like Tahiti. <laughs> so Foggy <laughs> Ah, I understood that reference. (laughs) So Foggy says in his thought balloons, what he doesn't know is that I'm here on a mission of love. It's been hard (laughs) enough to win Karen's heart when I had just Matt to deal with as a rival. But since his nutty twin brother Mike has made the scene, Karen barely knows I'm alive. But I have an ace up my sleeve. I know Karen has always admired the Jade Rose, a rare green, green flower that only grows in Vietnam. Only a few of them are left. And once I bring one back for her, she'll be Mrs. Karen Nelson before you could finish saying, Foggy, my boy, you've done it again. I just made, like, that blinking man gif. <laughs> like, excuse me? <laughs> Everyone knows the rose. Like, like <laughs> where is this so he's here, going? He's here on a scavenger hunt. Yeah. <laughs> and usually the military, like, they... They have their own in-house, like, Pentagon lawyers, I would imagine. But So Ross hands Foggy some papers, and he says, I'm sure that you'll find that everything is in order. And Foggy says, thanks, General. Now all I need to do is take a quick visual inspection of the rockets. And Ross says, the rockets? And in his thought balloon, he says, I completely forgot about the rocket. The Pentagon will have my teeth if they found out I used it to get rid of those ruly cadets, unruly cadets. Getting rid of Thompson and Baxter was worth it, dot, dot, dot. I hope. But how do I throw Foggy off my scent? I'd better stall. So Ross says, uh, yes, the rocket. It's this way, Foggy. Let's go look, find it. And Ross says in his thought balloons, think, Ross, think. Meanwhile, um, there's a quick scene with, um, Brainy Bobby, Guy Mailman, and Gary Ganade. They're sneaking into a locked control room because, uh, the premise here is that, uh, Brainy Bobby is going to hack into the control room and use the radio waves to get the rocket back to Earth. Uh, and, of course, there's sexism in this scene because Guy Mailman uses her bobby pin to pick the lock. When And when uh, she's asked how she got it, she says, oh, my date left it behind when um, she came to the cabin. To which Brainy Bobby says in a thought balloon for, like, the first time this issue, but not the last. Hmm, I wonder. So Guy says, let's hurry, Bobby. At, like, as they're at, the con- they're at the control room now. And Bobby says, let's, or Gary, or Guy Mailman says, let's hurry, Bobby. I can't imagine how frightened and confused Flash and Buzz might be. And meanwhile, in outer space, you see the boys. They're doing <laughs> that, pen, that, that. That description happened. Yeah. <laughs> they're doing air guitars, which I don't know if that was a thing in 1967, but evidently it maybe Stanley invented it. But they're doing air guitars in zero G and jamming out to uh, Jefferson Airplane. And Flash says, man, old guy in the gang will be as green as the Hulk when they find out that they miss this. But the rocket starts bumping, like as and Buzz says, "Uh, Flash, did we just hit a pothole?" And Flash says, "No way, Buzz. There's no potholes in space. Must have been a space deer." And then the rocket shakes again, and Buzz says, "Then what's hitting us?" Then we get Stanley narration. It says, "That's right, true believers. <laughs> the very same cosmic rays that gave the Fantastic Four their powers are now bathing your favorite private pussy cats." So back at the control room, Bobby has you has the radio signals locked on, and he's using it to pull the rocket back to Earth. And Guy says, "You did it, Bobby. I could kiss you." And Bobby gives her like a very puzzled look. And I'm actually surprised that the comics code let Stanley get away with this joke. So back in the rocket, Buzz uh, Flash says, "Buzzy, I don't feel so hot." And Buzz replies, "You said it, Flash. That's the last time I eat the cafeteria special." Meanwhile, Ross is still like stalling, like trying to like distract Foggy as they're like on their way to the launch pad. Like, oh, I could show you the new tanks. Surely you want to see those. And Foggy says, just the rocket, Ross, so I can be on my way. 
and Foggy Slop Balloon finishes, and look for that Jade Rose. And Ross says, well, there's also the beautiful beaches, and Foggy's now exasperated, and he says, look, Ross, can we just... And then all of a sudden, Foggy stops dead in his tracks mid-sentence because he sees Shashan off in the distance, crying under a tree because of Flash's earlier betrayal. And he sees the jade flower in her hair. So Foggy's thought balloon says, over there, in the distance, an indigenous girl. And the flower in her hair, it's the jade rose. So Foggy turns to Ross and says, actually, Ross, I think um, a walk on the beach will do me good. A walk on the beach alone. I'll catch up with you later and we can inspect the rocket then. So Ross looks at the readers and like shrugs his shoulders like, "Mm." (laughs) so, so we get a scene of foggy introducing himself to Shashan and with, and he, and he like braces himself with the all pop balloon saying, I know how short tempered females can be. And she probably doesn't trust Americans. I need to proceed with caution, earn her respect and honor her before I ask her that for the Jade Rose Run, wrong move, and I could wind up creating an international incident. America doesn't need to be at war in Vietnam. <laughs> <laughs> okay, 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 okay. What, what does Stanley mean by that? Because that's not a mistake. That's not like him not knowing what he's talking about. That's, that's just, uh, either that's commentary or Stanley was like on drugs. Or more drunk than he let on. <laughs> this was Stanley's subtle protest of the Vietnam War. Foggy Nelson trying to steal a flower from Shishan. Yes, of course. <laughs> it's symbolism. Oh. So, they, so they're talking a bit, and Shishan has the thought balloon. He's not as handsome or as fit as Flash, but he seems eager for my attention which suits me fine, I can use him to make Flash jealous. When Flash sees me walking around with this hotshot American lawyer, he'll regret taking girls for kissing sessions with him and Buzz. Again, together? So Shashan wants to make Flash notice her, and, and, you know, with Foggy, but the only problem is they're in space until they're not. So back in the control room, Guy Mailman is saying, hurry, Bobby, if anything happens to Flash and Buzz, I wouldn't be able to forgive myself. And Bobby says, calm down, old guy. You're acting over-emotional. And Guy thinks to herself, oh, I better be careful. My feminine instincts are coming through again. I better do something manly before they suspect my secrets. So Guy now says out loud, I just can't wait to arm wrestle Flash and Buzz when they get back. That's all. And Bobby says in his thought balloon, hmm, I wonder. So Gary says, don't worry. Bobby will have our hippie heartthrobs back before we can say, whoa. But he's saying whoa because he lost his balance and he <laughs> fell again but it's also and, apropos because of the comic <laughs> and when he loses his balance and falls his satchel of grenades comes out and it destroys the radio wave computer so now the three cadets are looking at the broken computer and say uh oh and bobby says with the rock and guidance system destroyed i'm afraid there's only one type of landing flash and buzz will be making and gary says and what's that you academic astronomer and you hear us, and like in the background, there's a big um, sound effect thing that says crash. And Bobby says, a crash landing. So the trio rush out to the crash site to, where they find the rocket in the jungle. Uh, to which you wonder, like, Ross didn't hear this. No one heard that. Like, there was no helicopter. Whatever. It- <laughs> We're in an alternate oh. universe. We're in an alternate universe where, like, explosions and crashes are silent and, like, grenades just turn your shoes in the sandals. So, so Guy says, oh, no, I hope they aren't hurt. And Gary says, galloping grenades. Nobody could have survived that. And Bobby says, according to my calculations, their chances of being unharmed are astronomically. And when he says astronomically, it's in big letters because this is a space-themed issue. Astronomically low. We then get a panel where we can see, like – um uh, uh, guy mailman and friends their faces but we can't see flash and buzz so like we're, we we're seeing their faces and we're seeing flash and buzz's speech balloons so the boys say so flash says that's the last time i let buzz take the wheel the only thing he drives is me me crazy and there's a pa- <laughs> and now we see the boys there's a panel of buzz he's half invisible and half not like we see like his silhouette but he's transparent and Flash is levitating in the air, surrounded by a flame, a la Johnny Storm. And Flash like looks at the looks at their friends and says, "What? What's everyone staring at?" End of part two. <laughs> so, chapter three, the final chapter of the book. Buzz's narration letter says, 
So there we were, love of my life, Flash and I in deep space. We knew we had to get the rocket back before Uncle Thundy noticed, or it would be an extra 20 push-ups. And these arms were meant for loving, not for pushing. <laughs> I, got the, <laughs> I got the ship back to Earth, but my parking skills may have been not have been as legendary as my kissing skills. Everyone's a critic. When we arrived, we saw Guy, Gary, and Bobby, and you wouldn't believe what happened next. Which, that's so like, why is he... It's a recap as if, like, this is the next issue, but, like, we don't need a recap of, like, the previous 16 pages. You yeah. know, I've, I've noticed this before in comics that have parts is, like, sometimes the writer will think that you took a break when you were reading, and, and it'll recap what just happened, just in case, you know, you stopped at the end of the chapter. <laughs> <laughs> I had to take a break when I was reading this. Like when I saw them with like the Fantastic Four powers, I had to like put the comic down and take like a long walk and cry like at the beach. Um, so I went back to my house and I finished reading. So Guy says, "You always said you were hot stuff, Flash, but this is ridiculous." And Gary said, "Buzz, when I said you were out of sight, I didn't mean to make a prophecy." And Flash says, <laughs> "Say what, Buzzy old boy? Do you understand their jive?" Sounds like they've been jamming to their Jefferson airplane records too loudly. So Guy pulls out a compact mirror from her pocket and says, maybe you too much should get a load of the reflection you're putting out. With Bobby thinking, why does Guy have a compact mirror? And Flash looks in the mirror and says, Clapton's guitar. I'm an ever-loving human torch. And Buzz's disembodied voice, because he's now almost completely invisible, like, loving nothing, Flash. You're not a human torch. That's a gag mirror. I can't even see my own reflection in it. It's like, okay, he's like, that mirror is fake. You're not the human torch. It's like, just look over and see him. (laughs) (laughs) You sure did find him out. So so like I said, Buzz is like, I can't even see my reflection in it. And Flash is, that's because there's nothing to see, Buzzy. You're as transparent as a sunbathing chick on the first day of summer. And Flash says, you're putting me on. And Gary said, I'm afraid he's right. Golly, our Flash and Buzz. A regular Fantastic Two. Uh. And how? <laughs> but but how? And Bobby says, I think I've deducted the answer. According to my calculations, when their rocket entered orbit, our cladish cohorts were hit with the same cosmic rays that gave the Fantastic Four their powers. And Gary says, of course, great grenades of Genghis Khan. What? Genghis Khan. Suffering Sappho. Well, like, g- Grenades weren't okay, whatever. Great grenades of Genghis Khan. So Flash has the powers of the human torch, and Buzz has the powers of the invisible of the invisible girl. Because the readers are like five years old and they needed that pointed out to them. So Buzz and Flash say in unison, Oh no! And Guy says, What's wrong, fellows? I figured you'd be happier than a general on a gun range when you with those groovy abilities. And Buzz says, We would, but and Flash says, It's that. And Buzz said, Not like this. And Flash says, I have the powers of the Human Torch. Black, that matchstick loser is Spider-Man's rival, and he wishes he was half the man Spidey is. Being decked out as Spidey's rival is the most humiliating thing a Spider-Man fan club president can be caught doing. What would old Wedheb say if he saw And, th- and that now? tracks, right? Because he, does, he doesn't like the torch from the dick of her, right? No, he doesn't, yeah. Gotcha. But, like, <laughs> I would think that having the power of flight, you know, when playing, <laughs> <we're> like, <laughs> like, he's like, oh no, I'm this guy <laughs> So we get Flash's um, thought balloon, and he's imagining a scene where he's, like, facing Spider-Man, and Spider-Man says, Flash Thompson, my number one fan, but what's this? Black, you're just like the Human Torch. Some fan you are, and here I was about to make you my sidekick. No way. I better find Puny Parker. Maybe he's interested. And we see in Flash's fantasy, like, Peter Parker, but, like... It's a very exaggerated version of what Peter looked like in Amazing Fantasy 15. Like, he's very, very gangly with glasses. Like, he looks like a nerd that, like, got left out in the sun too long. And he has an (laughs) evil look on his face. And he says, you can count on me, Spidey. So which, like, (laughs) like, is this how Flash imagines Peter? Basically, Peter Parker from (laughs) ASM issue 5, when he almost left him for dead at the hands of Doctor Doom. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and and we get an others note here and it says what flash doesn't know is that peter parker is the amazing spider-man but let's keep that our secret <laughs> no shit stan <laughs> so flash who's who's like like we cut back to like reality and like not flash's fantasy but flash's like speech balloon says no spidey come back please like <laughs> 
<laughs> and everyone's confused. And Buzz, who's ignoring Flash's weird moment, says, and I can't have the invisible girl's powers. And Gary says, afraid that chickies won't notice you anymore. And Buzz says, that's the problem, Gary. Everyone will notice me. And they'll know that I have the powers of a girl. I'll never live it down. <laughs> so <laughs> Buzz imagines himself wa- walking down the street and like the supporting cast of Vietnam a go-go. They're all pointing at him and laughing. And Ross says, don't forget your purse, Baxter. And Shashan says, hey, Buzzy, I have an extra ticket to the hair salon. Want to come? And so it's like, okay, editors note, like, apparently Stanley doesn't know that you don't need a ticket to get into the hair salon. And Gary says, let me hold the door for you, dear Miss Baxter. And Patsy, looking away in disgust, says, oh, Buzz, and I thought you were a real man. And Buzz says, like, Buzz is now out of his fantasy, like, and he's, like, talking to the gang. And he says, this is the worst thing that's ever happened to anyone that's been sent to Vietnam. And Guy says, the invisible <laughs> oh, okay. Isn't that right, John McCain? <laughs> <laughs> John McCain, like, probably became a senator because of this comic. He's like, Ugh. <laughs> uh, <laughs> So Guy uh, Mailman says, the invisible girl is not that bad. I hear she's the most powerful person on the team. Girls can be tough warriors, too. And Flash says, look, guy, I appreciate you trying to cheer us up by telling us these funny jokes, but we have a real problem here. All of a sudden, Ross's voice can be heard in the distance, and he says, mailman, grenade. Grenade's not his last name. Bobby, what's going on over there? And Flash says, I may be a human torch, but it looks like we're out of the frying pan and into the fire. And Buzz says, we can't let Uncle Thundy see us like this. No one's going to be seeing you, Buzz. And Flash says, he'll take one look at us. And realize we took his, we got hit by cosmic rays because we took the rocket for a joyride. He'll make us do 20 push ups. And Buzz says, My elbows are still sore from the last 20 push ups he made us do. <laughs> I thought you were in an army, army of sheep. <laughs> <laughs> Shut up. <laughs> <laughs> so, Guy in her thought balloon says, The boys think they launched the rocket. They don't suspect that Uncle Thundy sent them away on purpose best to let them continue believing that it would break their hearts if they ever suspected that ross doesn't always tolerate their presence which is like (laughs) uh, maybe (laughs) maybe. (laughs) so gary says you guys better hide and bobby says it looks like buzz already has a head start and buzz says phooey at least my powers are good for this but i feel like a real ninny and flash says that's because you are and buzz says flat has anyone ever told you that you make a real good mud flap and it's, I feel like Stanley was just like looking out his window, like, like insert insult here and just like picked one object. <laughs> <laughs> so guy says enough buzz, just remain invisible flash, fly away in the other direction before uncle Thundy sees you and flash says, whatever you say, fly guy, but I'd rather be web swinging Blah, What a rotten day. And his flash flies off. Like what a rotten day. I got to go to outer space and get superpowers. <laughs> like <laughs> I can't wait to go to bed. <laughs> So uh, Ross goes to um, so Ross goes to the trio and he doesn't see that Buzz is there because like he's invisible and he says Cadet Bobby instead of whatever Bobby's last name is because I guess he doesn't have one yet he's just Brandy Bobby am I glad to see you you're good with building machines right how long would it take you to build a replica of our B two rocket and Bobby says with the proper materials and under the right conditions at least twenty minutes <laughs> and Guy says why Uncle Thundy what's wrong with the old one. And Ross says, never mind the old one. Bobby, if you can build a new rocket in 20 minutes, and if it fools that hotshot lawyer, I'll see to it that Jimi Hendrix himself performs at our next USO show. And Gary says, (laughs) wowee, Jimi Hendrix himself. And Bobby says, I'll see what I can do, sir. And Buzz is excited, and he's forgetting that, like, he's invisible. And so he says out loud, you better brain weed. If we miss out on purple haze, then the only thing you'll be counting is calculators. And Ross says, who said that? And his thought balloon says, I could have sworn it was Baxter, but I sent him up to the stars. It must be my guilty conscience. So Guy Mailman, uh, thinking on her feet, says, oh, that was me, Uncle Thundy, practicing my ventriloquism. You never know what skills we'll need to fight those Viet commies. So Ross says, maybe I'd better go for a walk and clear my head. And Guy says, that was sure a close one. Bobby, how are you going to build a ship in 20 minutes? And Bobby says, simple. And he points to the crash ship that apparently Ross, like, didn't even notice he says i'll just show ross and foggy nelson that one 
<laughs> Simple as that. <laughs> so, so Gary says, "Be more careful next time. Be more careful next time, Buzz." But there's no answer. Buzz, great. Is his voice invisible now? So we cut to a panel where, like, you know how, like, when Sue Storm's invisible, like the reader can see her, but people can't. Yeah, like they so put we the see dotted outlines. Yeah, so we see, like, Invisible Buzz, and he's following Uncle Thundy, like, back to base, and he says, um, and the narration is now Buzz's letter, and he says, the guys were being real square, so I decided to follow Uncle Thundy. He's a real swinger, and I thought maybe if I follow him, I could learn his studly secrets. But meanwhile, Flash was having problems of his own, and we cut to Flash, who's trying to figure out the hang of, like, flying, um, you know, and we get a few panels of him, like, steadying himself and, like, controlling his flame, and Flash says, say, I just remembered, can't the Human Torch control his transformations by saying flame on and flame off? It's not like Shazam, but mm, I guess Stan I mean, is well, forgetting. Uh, how, how would he know that? Like one way or the other, like, like he, he wouldn't know how, how that would actually work. Well, it doesn't work like that, to be fair. Yes. <laughs> it doesn't, but for the sake of this, so Flash says... When Flash says um, transformations by saying flame on and saying off, like the narration says, and when Flash says flame off, it triggers, you know, um, a suspension of his powers. So he's now like 20 feet in the sky and um, he says flame off. So now he's back unflamed again and he falls and lands in a lake with a splash. And he says, me and my big mouth. Hey, there's my best girl, Shashan. Wonder who she's with. So on the other side of the lake, you see Shashan with Foggy and in her thought balloon, she says, it's Flash, and he can see me. Now they give him a real show. So she speaks out loud to Foggy and says, Oh, Foggy, those jungle noises are frightening me so. Hold me tight. And Foggy says, Why, certainly, Miss Sean. That's not her last name. And, uh, and he thinks in his head, Maybe she'll give me the Jade Rose as gratitude. So Flash says, She's making a play for that butterball. Of all the nerve, after I've been so faithful to her, <laughs> this, re- <laughs> this really burns me up. Flame on! And Flash ignites. Foggy is reaching for the flower in Shashan's hair, sneakily, when all of a sudden she jumps up. And she says, what was that? Which is like, because she heard Flash, like, flame on. And Foggy can't see this because, like, of where he's facing. And Foggy's panic. He says, nothing. I didn't try anything. So Flash tries to fly towards them, but he still isn't controlling his flat powers and his speed, and he overshoots and is like half a mile past them. And he says, say, what are all those screams? Could it be my adoring fans crying out for more? And when Flash turns around, he sees a primitive village of natives, and their houses are like all on fire, and like their boats and stuff like that. Like the people are fine because of the comics code, but like Flash is burning their village down. And he says, great drums of Ringo. That local village is caught in an inferno. What could have caused it? And Flash turns around and sees that he's left like a big, massive jungle forest fire in his wake. And he says, oh, no. So this is actually realistic narr- to real life, real life Vietnam. Just <laughs> setting things on fire. <laughs> so in Buzz's letter, he says, Flash was caught in a real pickle. Go after his girl or save the village. What would you do, dear reader? It's like, you're asking this to your girlfriend. Like, <laughs> he's like asking this to Patsy. Like, what would you do? <laughs> Stop the genocide that you've caused <laughs> or go after your girl because you're jealous. So Flash, is, <laughs> so Flash is panicking and wondering what to do. And he says to himself, wait, of course. I remember what Puny Parker once told me about evaporation. When water evaporates, it goes into rain clouds. And when the rain clouds are full, out comes the waterworks. So Flash flies to a nearby lake. And he blasts it with his flames, causing all of the water to evaporate rapidly. And in Stan's narration, it says, within seconds, the rainstorm begins and the fire in the village is um, extinguished. So that's uh, not quite what I learned in science class, but that's not the worst thing that Stan has ever come up with. That's not what anyone learned in science class. (laughs) It's not even what Flash learned in science class. He, like, heard it from Peter Parker, supposedly. And I guess Peter was just, like, screwing with him, but evidently it still worked. So Flash lands, and Shashan runs up to him. Oh, Flash, you were so brave putting that fire out. Forgive me. I was only being a jealous female, silly-headed female. There's just one thing I'm confused about. You never told me you were the Human Torch. And Foggy is, like, right behind them, and his thoughtful, and he says, Something smells rotten here. The Human Torch is an American named Johnny Storm. 
could this flash guy be trying be pulling a similar stunt like the time that i tricked karen into thinking that i was old hornhead and it says editor's notes I see that. <laughs> yeah see like daredevil and it like it's the issues where like foggy pretends to be daredevil like it's like oh yeah <laughs> that was something that happened so flash is horrified like by shashan's accusation he says the human torch no way i'd never be a loser like him but he looks off at the rain and he says still i did create quite the shower i hope my pal buzz is wearing his galoshes so meanwhile off in the distance buzz is still following ross and ross is still like reeling from hearing buzz's voice and he says my guilt is eating me alive Maybe I shouldn't have sent those boys up to space. What if something happened to them? What if the rocket malfunctioned? What if I killed them by sending them to space with only two weeks worth of food? The rain from Flash's storm starts to fall, and it makes Buzz slightly like appear like the outline of him. Because the rain is like, like y- you look and you see rain, but the rain is not hitting the ground where Buzz is standing. So Buzz, so like yeah. Ross is turning around, and he sees like a Buzz-shaped like hole in the rain and ross says baxter and buzz says "Uh uh-oh guess i'm caught uncle thundy and ross says ghost i've killed him and now he's come back to haunt me (laughs) as i deserve (laughs) and he runs away screaming and buzz drugs and said maybe he should switch to decaf so in buzz's letter he says after all the excitement we decide to meet the gang back up by the crashed rocket so everyone is there, Foggy, Shishan, everyone, every character in this book except for Ross. And in Foggy's Fop Balloon, he says, I thought Mike Murdoch was out there, but these soldiers are like a bunch of teenage, and teenage is like hyphenated because Stanley, teenage Mikes. So Flash says, how about it, Bobby? Can your brainy know-how change us back? I can't go through life as Spidey's biggest rival. You're not his rival. You just have the, his powers. And Buzz says, and I'll never live down having these girly powers. And Bobby says, I'm afraid the cosmic rays can't be removed from your body. But there is a plant that can offset its effects. It's incredibly rare. And he stops and he notices Shashan's hair. And he, like, plucks the flower out of it. And Shashan says, my hair. And Bobby says, yes, like the jade going. rose. <laughs> Say what? I like where this is going. <laughs> the jade rose. This rare plant has been known to absorb the powers of cosmic rays. So Bobby takes the flower and he puts it in front of Flash's buzz. And remember that like panel of like Kurt Connors changing back from the lizard in like issue six? This kind of looks like that. It's like we get three panels of like Flash and Buzz where Buzz slowly becomes visible again and Flash is like flame dies down and they say, We're cured. But when that happens, like the flower, all of the petals, like evaporate and drop to the floor and foggy says oh no the flower and foggy says the jade flower gone now i have to go back to america empty harrod handed karen will think i'm a big square so shashan picks up the stem from the ground and says if if it's the flower you want you're welcome to what's left of it so (laughs) So the issue ends with, like, you know, um, uh, Ross, like, bumps in the foggy again, and he's, like, Ross is still, like, trying to avoid, um, like, showing Foggy the rocket because he thinks it's not ready. But they see the crashed rocket there, and and he's, like, um, well, about the, the rocket? And he's, like, yes, I already saw the rocket, Ross, and everything looks – Looks good. Too bad that 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 massive, you know, like jungle fire ruined it. But that's not your fault. And I'll be sure to tell the Pentagon. And um, Buzz and Flash, they act like nothing has happened because like they don't want Ross to know that they took the joy ride. But they don't know that Ross thinks that they're dead or in space. So Ross is kind of ending the issue gaslight. He's like, but but is my mind playing tricks on me? Were they dead? Were they alive? How are they here as if nothing happened? And um, maybe I shouldn't be the general of of an army in Vietnam. (laughs) My sanity in question. Oh, well. (laughs) So 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 the issue ends with like guy mailman, you know, looking at, you know, the um, the reader and winking the end. (laughs) Wow. (laughs) Wow, indeed. Wow. I feel like, I, I know that like, we said that like you know this was like the last comic that Stanley worked on, but I feel that like this was like him, like really just throwing in everything at the wall, because like space and crossovers and magic flowers, and like I, 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 I like the three act structure. Like I really feel that like he like 
there was a last gasp of creativity with this one that I can't I can't I can't promise we'll see again. <laughs> yeah, the whole like Fantastic Four power it's like it's like it was almost an afterthought. <laughs> that was just kind of in there. Well, and the boys don't really like react to having powers among, uh, other than like being embarrassed. Like they never I don't know, like they never enjoy their powers or revel in it. <laughs> Well, it's also like like the the theme of this of this book is not taking anything, not taking the right priorities seriously. It's like you know, you know, the, we've been in the space and we have you know godlike powers. This is the worst thing ever. I would have thought that like Flash Thompson would have like attacked the torch and like you know, I can be the, a better torch, but he was like, oh man, this blades. And it's just like, dude, <laughs> you're in Vietnam. <laughs> like you should be. Taught how to how to see the advantage on certain things in wartime. <laughs> Stupid fool. Well, and this is like I don't know. Like it, this is like, there was a show that I used to watch on Nickelodeon called like Salute Your Shorts, and I feel like oh yes, minus like the magic powers. This is like Salute Your Shorts. Like everyone's in summer camp and like you know playing tricks on like the camp counselor. And... Yeah, and Ross is like ugly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like and the groovy chicks and like. Things like that. Uh, yeah, like Foggy and Sean, that was like the romance that nobody saw coming. Well, there's no such thing as like platonic friends in the Stanley era of any comic book. No. Yeah, everyone that sees each other is like, how can I use this person? Like, Foggy's like, oh, I can use her to get this flower. And Shishan's like, I can use him to make Flash jealous. Yeah, it's, it's, it's like, I, I, I need to, you know, yeah, the flower thing is just. That was a bit disappointing in terms of like just uh, somewhere along the line there's a war going on. I mean, I I would like to think, but <laughs> well, Flash did burn a village town. God. Like, <laughs> like there is that, which is like kind of horrifying. And yeah, I don't know my I don't know my Vietnam War history too well, so like I don't know if like the whole village like napalm burning thing was like happening at that like if that was in the public consciousness yet in 1967 or if stanley was just like telling a silly story and like added that in there i know by 69 it was absolutely like anti-vietnam war segment was absolutely a thing like by 69 so it was probably like like just kind of generating because i think that like what's the what's the issue where, where peter says you know this is a war that we don't we're not sure we want like because that's oh key. that's like in like the seven issue 70s or 80s or something like is it that far in that? I, thought, I thought it was like in the first 50 issues no, because no, because Flash doesn't even leave until issue forty-seven. Uh, yeah, but I thought that like he had commented. I know that it was probably one, during one of Flash's many returns. <laughs> I don't think anyone would be protesting the war if they saw all the wacky adventures they're having in <laughs> Vietnam. Go go! It's it's just a wild, wacky time with Good like people <laughs> using you know to. Um, I loved the dream sequences like throughout this issue, like Spidey, like you know, Blick, I'm gonna make Teeny Parker my sidekick. And Ross's whole, like, I now declare you, General Ross, President of the United States, because you, like, sent two teenagers into space. And the whole, like, you know, Father, I'm so impressed with you. I'm going to look for a man just like you. That that's, that's it shivers down my spine. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that was something that happened. It doesn't quite that... ring true with, with, like, today's sensibilities. Yeah, was that more accepted back then? The whole like girls need to find a guy like their father. I remember hearing that whenever I was growing up, like that girls tend to g- go after guys who remind them of their dads. I have no idea how true that is. I would imagine it's not that true, but it's something that I grew up hearing. I know that there's there's definitely like a harmless like you know, oh the daughters tend to be into what their mothers were into, which was like their fathers. But I think back in the day there was a more concentrated like. It, like, 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 you can say that now, and it's like, oh yeah, that's just you know a pattern of like mothers and daughters. But back then, it was like you need to find a man just like your father, because only your father knows how to take care of you, and only your only the husband knows how to take care of you. It was much more sinister back then, and much more creepy. Mm-hmm. <laughs> There's a lot of things creepy back then. A lot of things creepy about this book, like Foggy Nelson, like using this like native Vietnamese girl to like try and get a flower. I and- mean. <laughs> I don't know if this is this is actually Stanley at his most. Because I'm not read Sergeant John. How does Sergeant Fury and his Halle Commandos compare in terms of like, 
you know, World War II politics and Vietnam politics. And there's a lot of racism and sexism in this. It's almost like a, it's almost like a statement book. Yeah. Well. Okay. So Sergeant Fury. I mean, it's comedic, but within the realm of being comedic, it does take itself kind of seriously. This does not take itself seriously at all. This is not trying to tell any sort of realism in its stories. It's just, you know, making Vietnam more socially palatable or something. Make Vietnam fun was the mandate. Right. Make make Vietnam fun again. (laughs) Nobody was trying to make World War II fun with Sergeant Fury. I I think it was when you and Lily were doing um, the Avengers inspiration podcast, like I listened to your like Sergeant Fury episode and then like I went and I read the book and like, it was basically like Chuck Norris, but like, um, or like ultra instinct shaggy, but like Nick Fury, like the whole book was about like Nick Fury is the manliest man. And there's no one more manly than him. And one time he chewed like, you know, his way through a war and like a bomb fell on him and he said it tickles. And like, he, it, it was like very, very like, isn't Nick Fury awesome for like 22 pages. Yeah, I think that was the tone towards the beginning. It doesn't really stay like that, but he is definitely the manliest man. Well, shall we move on to the next one? I'm ready when you are. Let's do it. All right. So uh, looking at the cover of number five, we have um, Flash and Buzz relaxing on lawn chairs. And to their left is, is a person... Like in a butler's outfit sweeping the floor, but like this reminds me of that old Silver Age Superman comic where Superman in the future like had a wife, but like there was a black square over her face. You couldn't see what it is. So that's what they're doing here. Like they don't want to say, you know, because because the whole thing is who is Flash's and Buzz's new butler, and um, and yeah. So uh, what y'all think of this cover? <laughs> Reminding one of of, of a Silver Age Superman like Lois Lane stuff. It's definitely a, a point of interest because those comics are are, are are about as insane as this. But just knowing, I, I, honestly, knowing ahead of time because Josh told about it last year, like who the mystery maid is going to be, it's just like, <laughs> like, like, like I don't know. It's it, it's 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 funny because of the answer. <laughs> I dig the like just <laughs> looking at this cover. If I didn't see the words Vietnam ago, go, I would have no clue what this like book was about. Like, right? I mean, they're holding iced teas and stuff, and they're just like lounging around. Yeah, and I guess the beach umbrellas are camo colors. <laughs> yeah, so that's like the closest that we know that like they're actually in the military because the umbrellas are camo colors. But like, yeah, I, I do like the touch of like um, um, Flash's like bathing suit as they're lying there. Like, is like uh, has like Spider Man uh, uh, heads on it. I, I don't even know where he got that, but I love it. I also don't know why <laughs> why <of> this, them. <laughs> this, this butler is sweeping outside. But you know, that's a whole other thing. Oh um, yeah, <laughs> I never <laughs> thought about. that. <laughs> Flash and Buzz can't even order their butler to like clean in a way that makes sense. Okay, so this issue is called Doom with a Broom. And, uh, <laughs> awesome. So we open with Flash and Buzz in the commissary while they're finishing up their latest letters. And a uh, guy mailman walks by and she offers to take those letters to the depot. She's like, hey, boys. And uh, they're, they're appreciative. And, and as Guy is leaving, Flash looks at Buzz like this is the first time this joke has ever occurred to him. Wait a sec, mailman? And he's taking our letters for us? What a riot! And the best part is <laughs> Stanley's probably so proud of himself for coming up with that <laughs> in issue five. He's like, right. Why didn't I use this gag sooner? I was too busy making fun of girls, <laughs> right? <laughs> The best part is in that bottom panel, like guys in the background were about to leave, but she's totally giving Buzz the up and down. Anyways. <laughs> nice. So the boys are walking along. They're talking about missing things back home, how they have to do everything for themselves in the army. They don't have any nice ladies to help cook or clean. And <laughs> so they're just, you know, they have these little bubbles over their heads and they can use like moms. <laughs> Bringing them their food while they're sitting there watching TV. <laughs> when Buzz and Flash like came from, it was like 1950s Ozzy and Harriet. Right. 
So that's when Flash sees this like skulking hooded figure off in the distance. And they think it's an intruder in the camp. And 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 Buzz tries to be all like brave. But I don't know who he's fooling, but he like throws a few faux karate moves to to show he's ready to rough up anyone who comes their way. And I'm and I'm like, okay, yeah, but this is the army. You've been trained in hand-to-hand combat, right? Like your weapons are right there. <laughs> <laughs> just, j- j- just tell Gary to walk in his direction. He'll trip, and a grenade will fall. <laughs> <laughs> yes, they need Gary. <laughs> but evidently, it's all a front anyway. Because as they get closer to the stranger, Buzz is totally hiding behind Flash and making Flash go in front. It's pretty great. So they get close enough to this person, and we can see that it's a green hood and a green cloak. And they tell the stranger to turn around real slow. Now, this guy is leaning really heavy on the tree there, like he's weak or sick or something. And he turns around, and it's the bottom panel of the page. All we see is Buzz's and Flash's, like, face with their eyes bulging out and, like, this reaction shot. So, it's Foggy the, Nelson again. <laughs> Foggy Nelson. And, of course, the ad's here, so you've got to turn the page to see what's going on next. And it is, in fact, Dr. Doom here in Vietnam from who knows where, because I don't know. But there he is. So, Dr. Doom, and at first, Flash is really freaked out. And we get a couple of panels of flashback, just like in the middle of all this, about how Flash dressed up as Spider-Man way back in the day. You know, true believers, read Amazing Spider-Man number five. If you can find a copy, that is, we're fresh sold out. And, um... You know, of course, Flash got captured by Dr. Doom, so he's, like, really scared. Um, Buzz was scared anyway, so they're doing the whole, like, hold each other tight and shaking thing. But Dr. Doom hasn't moved. He hasn't attacked. He hasn't, you know, started monologuing. He's just kind of staring at them with, with, well, we shouldn't know what kind of expression he has on his face because he's wearing a mask. But the mask is kind of emoting and, like, the eyes are dull and the jaw is kind of slack and... So the boys have backed up quite a bit, and they start arguing, who's going to go talk to Dr. Doom? You talk to him. No, you. But you've met him before. Getting kidnapped doesn't count. And uh, finally, Flash goes in front of Buzz. is like, Mr. Doom, I, I mean, Doctor, Dr. Doom, sir, are you okay? And Doom is like, Doom, is that my name? Yes, that sounds right. That's right, kids. Dr. Doom has amnesia. Dun, dun, dun. Because why? Um, (laughs) Because patience. I'm I'm sure I can trust Stan Lee to come up with a rational explanation. Oh, you would expect that, right? (laughs) At some point? Oh, no. (laughs) So what would you do when you meet an amnesic Eastern European monarch in the jungles of Asia? Sneak him back to your tent. Relatable. (laughs) So the boys take him back to their tent and do mutter something about how filthy the inside of the tent is. And that gives Buzz an idea. He gives this really big wink at Flash. He's like, well, Doom, that's because you've been missing for days. (laughs) (laughs) What? (laughs) And Flash twigs to the idea. He jumps in. Yeah, Doom, you know what your job is around here, right? You're our butler. And Doom just stands there and, like, looks back and forth. There's, like, a little little two-faced back and forth panel there. And he raises a pointer finger straight at Buzz. And Buzz, like, starts to sweat because it looks like Doom's about to blast him with his finger blast. He's just like, (laughs) Omega sanctioned. (laughs) (laughs) And now Vietnam Ago goes just a Flash Thompson solo title. (laughs) Right. But instead he's just like, Dr. Doom is a butler. Yes, that sounds right. <laughs> and he grabs a broom from the corner and starts sweeping like it's Tuesday. And I'm like, I'm laughing at this point because evidently, if Dr. Doom has amnesia, he will do whatever you tell him to and think it's totally normal. He is completely chill. <laughs> And anyways, this- I, I do want to point out that like this is like page five and like in five pages, <laughs> Flash and Buzz have done what the Fantastic Four have not been able to do in like their 50 year history. Right. <laughs> <laughs> They've like Dr. Doom's defeated. He's domesticated like. <laughs> 
And it kind of goes from there. There's a little more shenanigans, especially because they have to hide Dr. Doom from Ross when he comes around. And in Guy Mailman, there's a one part where Guy Mailman helps him dress him up in disguise. Yeah, Uncle Thundy, he's my visiting cousin. Remember, you signed the <laughs> approval. Oh. <laughs> yes, because people visit here all the time. <laughs> of course. And- Somehow Ross completely misses the green cape sticking out of the back of his shirt. Or um, the metal face. Like, oh, yeah. it's <laughs> he has a skin condition that makes his skin metal. <laughs> right. Well, in the movies. Oh, God, that was a thing. <laughs> yeah. So so the craziest part is the ending, because throughout the story, the, the, we don't see Ross a whole lot, of, but the couple of times we do see him in the story, he's really stressed about this like visiting dignitary coming to inspect the camp. And I'm thinking, is this going to be a random general, maybe Captain America if they want to do a crossover? But no, the dignitary who's visiting Vietnam is Namor, Prince of Atlantis. And he's coming to do an inspection of their camp. And he ends up what like, dignitaries? Okay, Stan. Okay, never mind. Yeah. Like, <laughs> <laughs> because he gives well, two well, shits well, about like, this. That, that would be like I don't know. Like you know, we have like um, uh, Justin Trudeau like visit us at like the White House, and he's like, I must inspect the White House for like approval or like something like. <laughs> and he's 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 walking around in his green speedos and like nothing else except ankle wings, and um, he ends up catching. <laughs> Catching Doom cleaning things for the boys, and he recognizes him because, of course, they've had dealings. There was that one issue of Fantastic Four and maybe one other place. Uh, I, I think have, Avengers, too, right? Or was no, 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 that was him and Hulk. I was confused. Yeah, they haven't done super villain team up, that's in the future, so I don't think they've seen each other that many times yet. But, um, he does recognize Dr. Doom, and when he realizes that like Dr. Doom has been 